Revelation chapter 3, if you would. I like this lesson. I like it. This, this lesson will make us all look like Jesus. Amen. I want to look like Jesus. I want God to look at me and think he's looking at his son. That's what I want. So much, so much misunderstanding of the gospel and what salvation is among churches. The last uh, couple of weeks, I've been dealing with Calvinism. And um, if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. But I decided one day that there's two schools of thought on salvation, Calvinism and Arminianism. And I decided, it, it occurred to me one day that neither John Calvin nor Jacob Arminius, neither one of them were apostles. They were not prophets of God. They were not the original 12 disciples of Jesus Christ. So therefore, anything they would have written, I don't have to read it. I'm not bound by it. Um, my salvation is not hinged upon what they said. I can just read the Bible and believe the Bible. And if you look at some of the things that Calvinists believe, if you actually just read the Bible, you would never believe those things. Just reading the Bible, you never would. They, believe, they do not believe that Christ died for every man. They do not believe it. They believe that he only died for the elect. The uh, predestinated, as it were, and that your will, your freedom of choice is actually bound in chains by Satan and you cannot choose Christ. And I'm going, that's not true. It's not true. Adam and Eve had a choice. What did Joshua say that he and his house were going to do? He said, choose you this day whom ye will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua told Israel they had a choice. When the 12 spies came back from spying out Canaan land, the Israelites right then, and God had set this whole thing up for this one reason. The Israelites had a choice right then to either believe Joshua and Caleb who said... God has taken their defense away from them. They're giants, but God's taken their defense away from them. We're going to go over there and slaughter them. That land is ours. God promised it to us. And they rent their clothes over that. The rest of Israel was going to stone Joshua and Caleb over that. And they were said, let us make us a captain and let us go back to Egypt. Clearly, they had a choice. And they chose the wrong one. And God said, fine, I'm going to make you wander in the wilderness for 40 years and your carcasses are going to fall in the wilderness and none of you are going to see the promised land. And uh, when it comes to John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten, how much of the world did he love? The whole world. That whosoever believeth in him. But they play games with Greek words. And they say, whosoever doesn't actually believe, mean everybody, it only means the elect. And I'm going, you'll never get that just reading the scriptures. So, and I've been dealing with that because a, a guy that called in to the office last week said that somebody that he works with uh, and is a good friend with, and he said, I consider him to be a Christian friend in his family, he's a good Christian family, but they've fallen into Calvinism. And he said, I want to be able to answer him with scripture and hear him out on some things. But he said, I can't believe he fell for it, but he did. And uh, so anyway, there's just a lot of different wrong ideas of what salvation is. Some people believe that once you qualify under church membership terms and you have your church, na your name written on a church roll somewhere, that that qualifies you as being a Christian and you're going to heaven. But that's not the case either. And so Jesus said it like this in Revelation chapter 3 verse 4. This is the church in Sardis. And he said, thou hast a few names even in Sardis. Watch this now. Which have not defiled their garments. 
Do you remember the wedding feast? <clears throat> Jesus taught this parable of a, of a man that threw a feast for a wedding for his son and invited all of the people that would come and they made excuses why they couldn't come. And then he said, go you out to the highways and hedges and compel them in that they would come. So all these people come to the wedding that were never originally invited. And that's the Gentiles. But one man shows up and they can tell that he's the odd man out. He's the oddball of the group. And why? What it, was it about him that made him stand out from the rest of the crowd? He didn't have a wedding garment on. Now, I don't know exactly what type of clothing that was. But apparently there was something special that if you went to a wedding, you wore this particular thing, whatever it was. And that specified that you were part of the wedding party. And it was like your ticket into the feast. And there was a man that showed up without a wedding garment on. And what happened to him? He was summarily dismissed and cast out from the wedding feast. So how dare you show up here without a wedding garment on? You can't be in here. And they cast the man out. And so he said, there are a few in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. And let me just say this. If some people in a church don't want to walk the walk, talk the talk, live the life, and do what the Bible says to the best of their ability. If there are some people who don't want to do that way, or maybe God hasn't convicted them to a point where they're willing to change, what is that to you? If, if they're the ones who are not living right, then that should encourage us to not be like them and to live the right way. In other words, there were people in this church that knew of the things that were going on in this church and knew the problems that they had, that they had a name that they were alive, but they were dead. But he said, you have a few of them there who have not defiled their garments. And he said, verse, he said it in verse uh, 4, they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. I tell you what, the greatest day in your life will be when you hear your name called by Jesus Christ to his Father. I used to be sort of the guy in P.E. class. You don't even know what I'm going to say. That didn't always get picked first for the team. Unless we were playing certain games and there were certain positions when we played, when we played um, hockey in the gymnasium, I always picked goalie. Nobody else wanted to be the goalie. I wanted to be the goalie. And I dressed the part, man. I had a baseball mitt and I put the mask on and I had knee pads on. And I tell you what, it was a very rare occasion when I let that little rolling ball come past me into that goal. Well, after a while, that gets noticed. And when the guys are picking teams, they say, Augard, come on over here. We need a goalie. So I was always kind of proud of that. Nobody else could do it. I'm going to do it. But there's no greater day in your life than when Jesus looks at his father with the roll book. We sing that song, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. And he calls your name out to his heavenly father. And they say, come in. Come on in. The table's waiting. He said, I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. What does this mean? In verse 5 when he says, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. 
And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father. What does it mean that he shall be clothed in white? Galatians chapter 3, turn there. And, and again, all of this is an understanding of what salvation is. And since it's Christ who clothes us, then that means it is not the church that clothes us. It is not a church or a minister, a reverend, a priest, a pastor, an evangelist, somebody calling themselves an apostle, which I don't believe. It is not a man who says to you, you're saved or you're not saved. It is Christ who adorns you with the proper clothing. Um, I don't know if this is in my notes, but go back to the story of Adam and Eve. The moment they sinned and their eyes were opened, but they were open to the fact that they were both naked before God. And immediately... They began to hide and to cover themselves from the presence of God because they were both naked. Before they ate of the fruit, they, they were naked, but they were not ashamed of their nakedness. Now, because sin has entered, entered into the world and sin brings shame, sin is a reproach unto any people, the Bible says, that now they realize they're unclothed, they're naked before God, and they seek to cover themselves. And what did God do? Well, what did they do? They made themselves aprons out of fig leaves. But that is insufficient. God had to kill an animal and use its skin to clothe and to cover Adam and Eve. In other words, God covered Adam and Eve's shame himself. And that then was accepted by God, which that was a foreshadow of what Christ would be doing. Galatians 3 verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith, not works, in Christ Jesus. What are works of righteousness? What kind of clothing would you have on if you wore works of your own righteousness? Filthy rags. And God would look upon you and say, it's not sufficient. So as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Remember what Jesus said in the par and when he's talking about, I am the vine, you are the branches. If ye abide in me, and I abide in you, it works both ways. Then you'll, then you'll be uh, blessed of my Father. And he said in verse 28, When we have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. At that point, your race doesn't matter. Somebody say amen. Your race doesn't matter. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So on the day of judgment, what God is looking for is his son, Jesus Christ. Remember, um, that phrase, that verse where it says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? For what's happened is, Christ came and sat in the seat of condemnation where we were, 
And he's caused us to rise up from the seat of condemnation and come sit in heavenly places. Christ took our place being condemned, though he did no sin, and he gave us his royal seat next to the throne of God so that we are seen then as the children of God. That's how God will look upon us. Since we have put on Christ, when God looks at us, He sees His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. And He knows that He's not laid anything to the charge of Jesus Christ. Therefore, if we are in Christ, there is now no, therefore no condemnation to them who walk after the Spirit and not walking after the flesh. So it takes being clothed upon by God Himself. And what God is doing, He is taking the white, pure robes of Christ and adorning them over us, covering up our transgressions so that God does not see them. We know we did them. But we've been washed. We've been sanctified, purified, cleansed. And now we're glorified in that we are wearing the robes and the covering of Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 61. Look at there. Isaiah 61. Almost there. Verse 10. Oh, let's, let's back up a little bit and go to verse 7. Isaiah 61, 7. For your shame ye shall have double, and for confusion ye shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore in their land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. What did Elisha want from Elijah when Elijah went, what did you say, Gary? Double portion. You understand the connection now? So I, here's what I believe. I believe on the day of Pentecost, God poured out His Spirit. And it, on that day, it was on the Jews. But we also know then later at Cornelius' house, that God poured His Spirit out upon Cornelius, who was a Gentile. And Cornelius spoke in tongues, as they did on the day of Pentecost. Peter making a note of that, on, and at the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15 reiterated that and said, I was at the Gentile Cornelius house and the, and I preached the gospel and they believed it and the Holy Ghost fell on that place and it baptized them all and it filled the, all, them all and Cornelius spoke in tongues and his house spoke in tongues just like we did on the day of Pentecost. And what God, he, Peter got it. Peter understood that what God was doing he was justifying the Gentiles even though they had not kept the works of the law. They had not been circumcised. And if you go back to the circumcision of Abraham, Abraham has already believed God and God, the Lord imputed righteousness to him before he was circumcised. And Paul made a point about that. He said, was our, not our father Abraham justified before circumcision or after circumcision? And it was done before. So circumcising them does not give you the Holy Spirit. Obeying God, what God tells you to do flawlessly, does not give you God's Spirit. It does not give you salvation. Believing what Christ has already done, that's what gives you salvation. And then God will give you the blessing and the grace to do what He wants you to do after that, that point. Isaiah 61.10 I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God for He hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. Clearly, there are garments of salvation and I also believe that there are garments of condemnation. Works of righteousness alone are as filthy rags as God, in God's sight. And God said to those who try to get by on their own righteousness, God said, I have cast thee away as a menstruous cloth. Dirty, a dirty rag. 
God said, I've cast you away. Why? Because you're trying to tell me how good you are. And you think that by your own works, you're going to get to heaven. God says, I'm going to cast you away. So he clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments. And as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. I do recall on our wedding day that it took my wife all day long to get ready for that wedding. It took me 10 minutes. I did comb my hair on that day. But that was her day. She wanted to look as beautiful and she did. She wanted to look as beautiful as she could for her husband. And I was blessed on that day and been blessed ever since. But he hath clothed me with garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robes of righteousness. Again, God is the one who does that. Who baptizes us? God. Who washes us? God. Who sanctifies us? God. Who clothes us? God. Churches don't. And churches can't. You're not any more saved by going to this church as you would be going to any other church. Churches cannot do that for you. And don't let any church, religious organization, any minister, any evangelist, any prophet, any apostle, anybody tell you that they can give you salvation or they can take away your salvation if you don't do what they tell you to do. It's a lie. You're done so you're covered by Jesus Christ. Look in um, Genesis 3. I mentioned that earlier. Genesis chapter 3. This is a doctrine, again, as I said earlier, that goes all the way back to the very first sin that was committed on this earth. It's the sin of Adam and Eve. And God dealt with it exactly the way God deals with us. Now, Genesis 3, I have verse 20 up on the screen. Let's look at the context. Um, we see in verse 14, God said because to the serpent, Because thou hast done this, cursed art thou above all cattle, above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Then he says in verse 16 to the woman, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception and sorrow shalt thou bring forth children. And that definitely is true. Unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake and sorrow shalt thou uh, eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt... Um, uh, thou shalt eat the herb of the field in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground for out of it was thou taken for dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return. And so he says in verse 20 and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. That means she is the mother of us. And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. So it's not a new doctrine. It's not a doctrine that shows up after the crucifixion of Christ and only applies to the Gentile church and the Gentile church age. It is an idea that applies all the way back to the original sinners and the original sin and how God dealt with the original sin. And you have to ask the question here. Since God is going to clothe them with his righteousness, he's going to cover their transgressions, in other words. He's going to hide it and cover it with his righteousness. What was it that Adam and Eve did to convince God that he should clothe them in his righteousness? Did they pay God for it? Did they offer God to sacrifice their firstborn son? No. Truth of it is, there was absolutely nothing that Adam and Eve 
offered to do to God, for God, or did for God that merited God clothing them in His salvation. Not one thing. God simply did it out of His love for Adam and His love for Eve. In other words, it was grace and it was unmerited favor that God showed upon Adam and Eve and nothing else. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, turn there. Welcome, make yourself at home. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, he's talking about our bodies. We have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. What did Jesus say in, what was it, John 14? When his disciples, he was walking with his disciples and he said, I go to prepare a place for thee that, in, that where I am, there you may be also. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you so. So I'm going to prepare that place for you so that you have a better house to live in. And your house now the plumbing leaks, the floors creak, the doors don't stay shut like they're supposed to, air conditioner doesn't work properly, all kinds of things go bad with it, but up in heaven, there would be nothing wrong with that house that God gives you. We know, back in 2 Corinthians 5, we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands. Think about it for a minute. The tabernacle that Moses built in the wilderness, where is it right now? Where is it? Is it in a museum? Truth of it is, we don't know where it is. It's, for all intents and purposes, it's gone. We don't have any idea where it is. And I don't think God, I personally don't think God's going to let it out where it is. If it exists anywhere. It may have to turn to dust. Who knows? But I don't think God's going to let it be discovered. Solomon, the temple that he built, took seven years. And it was a grand, beautiful temple that he built in honor of God. And God blessed that. By bringing forth and manifesting his presence in that temple. And yet, where is that temple now? It was raised to the ground. The temple that they built after it, when they came back from Babylonian captivity, and then King Herod renovated it, that's why they called it Herod's temple. Where is it right now? In 70 A.D., the emperor of Rome came in, burnt Jerusalem to the ground, and destroyed that whole temple area. All the buildings of the temple destroyed every one of them. With the exception, of course, of the Wailing Wall. It still exists there as a testimony. God destroyed them all. Why? Because they were temples made with hands and God doesn't really dwell in those temples he dwells in this house that he made so in verse 2 2 Corinthians 5 he said for in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven see the next house that we get the next body that we get is not going to come from our earthly parents or any earthly parents or genetic modified genetic engineering. It's not going to come that way either. Somebody say amen. Uh, be careful. Be careful. I've been warning about this 
But we're, we're in those days now where doctors are developing, medical scientists, research labs all over the country and all over the world. They are taking human DNA, adding things to it, taking things away from it, including a um, biotech company in Israel mingling, what was it, mouse DNA with human DNA or chimpanzee DNA with human DNA? People, that's an abomination. There's a reason, there's a reason why God in the natural world, rhinoceroses by nature have no inclination whatsoever to mate with monkeys. And I guess the monkeys are glad for that. But now we have the opportunity, we have the ability now in this world to mingle rhinoceros DNA with human DNA. We can create monsters. And they're going to. And you're hearing a lot about what's called CRISPR. That's genetic modification. And it is rapidly becoming a part of your doctor's choices on how to treat your ailments. And I've said this before and I will continue to say it. Do not let anybody alter your DNA. Don't do it. Stay away from that. You don't know what the effects are. You don't know how it's going to turn out. You don't know what is going to happen. They may say we have it all under control, but I don't believe that. I believe man is playing God by doing things with genetics that only God should be doing. Amen? I mean, if God wanted to mingle a rhinoceros with a monkey, he'd have done it already. Okay? But in this case, he said, verse 2, For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. You see, that house from heaven won't creak when the wind blows. Won't make noises when it moves. Amen? And we all get to the age where we make noises when we move. Ugh. Ugh. We groan, earnestly desiring that. Verse 3, if so, being that, be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. And again, God is not going to allow us to wander through heaven naked. He's going to clothe us. Uh, verse 4, For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we should be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. But what's the opposite of that? If we are present with the Lord, it means being absent from the body. And one of these days, I'll take that. Amen? For we walk by faith, not by sight, the Bible says. Now turn to Revelation 19. I'll cut it off here. Like a big stick of baloney, I'm going to cut it off right here. Meaning you've had enough baloney for one Sunday school. Revelation 19. The Bible says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Now, now what notice this? To her it was granted. 
She didn't earn it. She didn't deserve it. But it was granted to her by grace that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And again, I always like to draw your attention. If you, if you have uh, other Bibles around your house like an NIV or a New American Standard or the Holman Christian Standard Bible or any of these modern translations, here's what you'll find in verse 8. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints or the righteous acts of the saints. Now, what's wrong with that statement? It works. It says that we will be clothed upon by God based upon the works that we did down here on earth. That's a lie. It's not the same doctrine. That doctrine... Um, I was talking with a couple one time. He used to be a Freemason and she was Eastern Star. And they were asking me if I thought Freemasonry was compatible with Christianity. And I said, no, and let me tell you why. I said, at a Freemason's funeral, or when you go to the lodge, they give you a lambskin apron. And I said, that apron, they tell you, is representative of the work that you completed as a mason. And that when you stand before the great architect of the universe, that he will see the apron that you wear, and he will say that you're worthy to enter into the celestial kingdom because of the work that you finished here on this earth. And I said, but the Bible says that it's not by works we're saved, but by grace. And his wife, she was sitting there shaking her head. And she said, I know they believe that. She said, I've done enough Masonic funerals to know that that's exactly what they believe. And I asked her, I said, do you know biblically that that's wrong? And she said, yeah, it is wrong. Well, they both left the Masonic Lodge. Okay. Having been confronted in a loving way. With the doctrines of the Bible, which they sort of knew. They then realized that it was incompatible with what they believed as Bible-believing Christians. And they withdrew. Okay? So it's not the righteous acts. It is the righteousness wherewith Christ, by his love and mercy, grants to us that we are clean and white in God's presence. Somebody say amen. Father, thank you for taking dirty, filthy people who have done horrible, unclean deeds and yet at times wanted to boast of our own goodness, boast of our own righteousness. And you said that they were nothing but filthy rags and you cast them away as a menstruous cloth. God, we're thankful, God, that you loved us and magnified that love toward us and that you clothed us in, the, in fine linen, white and clean. And now, in the sight of God, we have the righteousness of Christ adorning us so that all that God sees is the righteousness of His Son in our life covering our transgressions by grace, through faith. Thank you, God, for this good word. We needed it today. Maybe somebody this week has struggled with their weaknesses. Things, God, that they know, God, that they can't overcome by their own strength. And God, it, it may be just bothering them this morning, but... Father, what a God you are in that you loved us so much... That you forgave those sins. You caused us to cry out unto you. And you forgave those sins. And now we are clean in your sight by your righteousness. And by the blood of Jesus Christ. Bless your word today we pray in Jesus name. And all of God's people said. Amen, Amen to that.